We're going to start things off in double-A this time with the Richmond Flying Squirrels as they're taking on the Bowie Bay Sox, who are sending out right-hander Tyler Herb. This will be his 32nd start of the year, and opposing him will be another right-hander in Logan Webb. This will be his 28th start of the year, a 3.88 ERA. Take a look at the Flying Squirrels lineup, as well as the Bowie Bay Sox lineup. We'll start things off bottom half of the first inning. Tito Polo at the plate is going to hit a ball into right field to lead off the inning with a base knock. After that, it's Ricky Ruff at the plate, and he's going to smoke one down the right field line. Tito Polo rounding second, heading into third. He's going to head home as well, throw into the cutoff man. They do not throw home. RBI double for Ricky Ruff makes it a 1-0 lead. Top of the second, Chris Davis is all the way down in double A, and he is going to draw a walk. So he's on first base. After that, Akimi is going to hit a ball into right center field. That's only going to be a single, but Davis does get the third base. So runners on the corners, nobody out brings up Rafelia, and he is going to pop a ball into the shallow outfield that is put away by Ruff, so one down now. After that, Anthony Santander pops the ball up into foul territory. Davidson puts that one away. And then with two outs, it would be Reyes or Yerzy draws a walk, and then Reyes also draws a walk that brings in a run. Webb cannot find the strike zone, his third walk of the inning, and it ties the game at one. He would finally get out of the inning, though, by getting Fregia to fly out to left field, but it was a close call as it was a long fly ball, and Mark Strange had to run into the wall to make the snag. So top half of the third, Logan Webb, start, Logan Webb starts it off with another walk, and then Emilio Cruz, the finesse lefty, comes out out of the pen to take his place as the Flying Squirrels are not playing around. They bring on Cruz who strikes the first batter out. Then Chris Davis comes to the plate, pops one up into the infield. That's going to be two down. And then after that, it's going to be a Kimmy who will ground out to second base for the third out of the inning. So Cruz retires the first three batters he faces. Bottom half of the third now, Tito Polo getting his second hit of the game, another base knock for him, but then he would immediately be picked off at first base as Davis lays on the tag on the pickoff from Herb. So then with two outs, it's Ricky Ruff who's going to hit a ball hard into right field, but it'll be right at the fielder as that is the third out. So still 1-1, bottom of the fifth now. Raynell Delgado is going to hit a ball back up the middle for a base knock, so he's on first. Now with one out, it's Nick Allen who's going to go down the left field line. That'll get up against the wall. Delgado heading into third, thinks about going home, decides to go back at the last second, and they gun him down, diving back into third. So Allen's on second with two bats. Tito Polo then gets his third hit of the game, another single. This one will drive in a run, and Nick Allen, as he scores to take a 2-1 lead for the Flying Squirrels. Bryant Crandall, another finesse lefty coming out of the pen for the Flying Squirrels, gets a strikeout for the first batter on Akimi. After that, it's Rafelia who also goes down looking. So it's two down now, brings up Santander, who's going to fly one out to right field. That's a can of corn for Joe Gray Jr. out there. We move on to the top of the seventh where Ike Odom, the Aussie, comes on. With his long blonde hair, first pitch he throws is going to be taken over the left field fence as Reyes did not miss that one. A solo shot ties this game up at two here for the Bowie Bay Sox in the top of the seventh. We'll move on to the bottom of the eighth now. Joe Gray Jr. at the plate hits a ball into the right center field gap. He's got some decent wheels, so he's going to use them. Round second, he's going to go into third base with a triple for Joe Gray Jr. After that, now with one out, it brings up Elliot Ramos. Smacks a ball into center field. That'll be put away, but it is enough to tag up Joe Gray Jr. from third and score him to take a 3-2 lead. Seth Corey comes on for the save in the ninth. He would get himself into a bit of a jam with runners on first and second, but then get the batter to line up to right field as he does complete the save. Richmond Flying Squirrels win this game over the Bowie Bay Sox at home by a score of 3-2. Nick Allen, despite not being the greatest hitter on the season or as a prospect, does go two for three on the day with two doubles. Tito Polo had three hits, three of them singles, drove in a run on one of them, and Joe Gray Jr. had a triple. Braxton Davidson was two for four with a double in this victory for the Flying Squirrels, three to two. But let's talk more about some of the prospects at the AA level. 
So to start things off, you've got Ricky Ruff, who has a 775 OPS in AA, 15 home runs, 21 steals. He's an all-around player. He can play all around the field, third base, shortstop, second base, at a high level at any of those positions. He is just all-around good at every, pretty much every asset of his game is at least decent. He's in AA all this season, he will be in AAA all next season, and he is a guy to keep an eye on because his ratings makes him one of those players who's a C potential prospect where if he has one really good season, he could easily develop into an exceptional player. Tito Polo had a great year in AA with an 827 OPS, but he did not start the year in AA. He started in AAA, struggled quite a lot, and then was sent back down to Richmond, and that's where he really started to pick things up, and his ratings did go up quite a bit throughout the year because of that. So Tito Polo is a pretty decent player. He's a guy who could end up being like a fourth or fifth outfitter at the big league level uh, eventually. He's good defensively, got good speed, decent contact with plate skills. We acquired him in the trade in 2019 to Seattle, where we sent Nick Vincent to them. So who knows, Tito Polo could eventually end up in the big leagues for us, but he needs to show that he can hit a triple A until I actually feel comfortable calling him up to the big leagues at some point. Mark Dr. Strange with a 773 OPS. He was hurt for around two months, like one and a half, two months in the season, just recently came off the injured list. He is a pretty interesting player in that he is very fast. He's a base stealing threat. He's good defensively, but he's got a Johnny Damon arm, so he's more suited to be like a left fielder than he is a center fielder or right fielder, but he could play center if we really needed him to, because he definitely has the fielding and the reaction to play it. Just no arm, like I said. He's got a great contact bat. He has absolutely no power, though, and he's got decent plate skills. So he'll be 20 next season. He'll start the year in AAA. He's another guy to keep an eye on for because he's another one of those C potential guys where if he has a really good year, he could easily jump up quite a few decent ratings in his, uh, in his attributes. Braxton Davidson was acquired by us in the Carlos Gonzalez trade at this year's trade deadline. He was in Class A with Atlanta, so he was not playing any games. Therefore, these AA stats are all with us. He has 83 ABs in AAA, in AA I should say, 840 OPS in those 83 ABs. And his plate discipline is the most intriguing part about his game. Very good play discipline. He's only 23. He'll be 24 next season. He's good defensively. Can play some corner outfielder, but we're looking at more of him as a first baseman. And if his bat develops a bit more, he could be a very solid first baseman at the big league level. He will be our AAA first baseman next season, most likely. And hopefully he can put together a pretty good year in the minors and develop quite a bit of that bat. Elliot Ramos, 761 OPS, 14 home runs. He was in AAA for quite a bit, probably like a solid month and a half, but he struggled in AAA quite a lot, so I sent him back down to AA. I still plan on giving him every opportunity to win the big league, to win a big league corner outfield spot next season, but he just hasn't been the greatest in AAA, but hopefully he's able to make the jump from AA to the big leagues because I do plan on playing spring training next season. We're going to make a video out of that and then go over all the stats and decide who's going to start where based on spring training because we have a lot of guys competing for jobs. Joe Gray Jr., if you remember from the first minor league update video of the season, he had a very, very hot first half of the season, but he cooled off in the second half and his OPS dropped down to 753. Plus, we didn't really have room for him in AAA, so he spent the entire year in AA. He's only 20, so it's no big deal. He'll be 21 next year. He'll probably be in AAA next season when some of the older prospects won't be back next season and there'll be more spots opened up throughout the minor leagues. And I'm not going to talk too much about him because he is definitely going to be getting a prospect profile in the next season. Tyler Stevenson is a guy we signed in the offseason because the Reds just did not bring him back. He's got a 739 OPS. Not the greatest, but he still has a pretty solid hitting prospect. He's not quite a catcher, though. So I'm thinking of moving him full-time to being a corner outfielder first baseman next season because I feel like that's really where he shines as a bat rather than being a catcher because he's just he's not a good catcher. But with that being said, unless he really lights the world on fire in AAA or AA, whatever level he's at, and he impresses the hell out of me, I don't think he's ever going to really force his way into the big leagues for us. So for us, he's probably more of a trade bait once we actually become good, and if we didn't make a trade at the deadline, he's probably a guy who will be sent off at the deadline for somebody we acquire. Now onto the pitching side of things, Logan Webb in AA with a 3.88 ERA and a 3.68 FIP, 
decent season. He's one of those prospects who has sneaky good ratings that could be pretty good if he has really one one really good year and he develops a lot. So he is a guy to keep an eye on. He'll probably be in AAA next season, depending on what actually happens in the offseason. Obviously, all this stuff where I'm making predictions for next season all require all depends on what happens in the offseason. Maybe we make trades, maybe just some insane prospect is available in free agency for some reason, or some some uh, guy who has a couple years of Major League service but they didn't want is going to be signed. You have no clue what's going to happen in the offseason because it's an MLB The Show offseason. So things could happen that changes the plans a bit, but as of right now, that's probably where he's going to be next year in AAA. Tim Kate had a 340 ERA with a 334 FIP. Pretty good year in AA. Not going to say too much about him because he will be getting a prospect profile next season. Ben Madison had a pretty good year as well. 358 ERA, but a sub-3 FIP at 283. He will be in AAA next season. He's similar to Logan Webb, and he's one of those prospects who, if he has a good year, he could definitely be a pretty intriguing prospect. Emilio Cruz was my sixth round pick in the 2019 draft. You saw him in the game. He looked pretty good in the actual game. He felt good to use. His numbers haven't been the greatest at the AA level. And I doubt he ends up being a starter long term because we just have so many better starters throughout our organization. And a finesse lefty reliever who doesn't really put the greatest numbers with not the greatest ratings isn't really something that's intriguing. But with that being said, we do have Bryant Crandall, who is a finesse lefty reliever who we picked up in free agency at the deadline because when we made a couple of trades at the deadline, some people got called up, and uh, that means we needed to make some adjustments to our minor league system because when people got called up, our double-A relievers kind of got a bit thin, so we had to go out there and dip into free agency, and there's always some decent guys out there who are like C-potential prospects who teams just didn't sign because they're like low overalls. And Bryant Crandall was one of those, and he actually has pretty decent ratings. Like I said, he's a finesse lefty, and uh, he's only 18 years old, so he could be an interesting option for us in a few seasons if he continues to have a uh, couple good seasons in the minor leagues. He's nowhere near Major League ready, but he could be an option a couple years down the line. Ike Odom, also one of those free agent relievers we picked up. He's an Australian. He throws hard. He's got lots of, lots of pitches to work with. Also only 18. He could be another guy to keep an eye on. Antoine Hinosa is our third round pick from the 2019 season. He's having a pretty good year in AA. 314 ERA, 334 FIP. He's been in the bullpen all year long. He's got decent rate. At least I think he has. I'm not really sure. But he has decent ratings. He only has he's only 19 years old, so he's still very young. He could be something to keep an eye on as he uh, develops throughout the next couple seasons. He's a C potential guy though, so he's not close to being major league ready, but Fast forward two, three years down the line, he could be something that could keep an eye on. On to the AAA team with the Sacramento Rivercats now as they're taking on the El Paso Chihuahuas who are sending out one of the Padres' top prospects in left-hander Mackenzie Gore having a good, good year in AAA. And opposing him will be another lefty top prospect, Jay Groon, the man from Barnegat, New Jersey. This will be his 11th AAA start. And take a look at the Rivercats lineup as well. Bottom half of the first inning, Edwards hits a ball up the middle, Peter Mooney fields, and he's not going to be able to throw out the speedy Edwards at first base, who the then tries to show off the speed, tries to steal, Joey Bart, perfect throw down, shows off the gun and gets him. Bottom half of the third now, Mackenzie Gore in the nine hole, the pitcher draws a walk and then Edwards says, you know, I'm just going to skip running the bases this time and hits a ball into the left field seat so he's going to trot around the bases instead. A two run shot puts the Chihuahuas up 2-0 here in the third inning. On to the top of the fourth now, Avellino chops the ball down the left field line that'll get into the outfield. He's going to try to stretch it into a double. Pretty fast, slides in the second, but he's going to be gunned down on the throw, trying to stretch that, so that brings up Seth Beer to the plate. Some lefty-on-lefty -lefty crime as he's going to smack one back up the middle for a base knock. So his tight pants and him are on first base, and then Connor Joe would grind a ball over to third base for an easy out as they were still 2-0. Bottom of the fourth now, Jay Groom gets a line out from Franchi Cordero as Sheldon Ness makes the snag on the hot corner. And then for the third out would be a running fastball away from Ty France, which would be the third out swinging. And now onto the bottom of the fifth, Amaya comes to the plate, hits a ball past the glove of the leaping 
Gilberto Fuentes for a base knock, and then a ball would get away from Joey Bart, so it allows Amaya to move up to second base in scoring position, but he would not go anywhere as then Ruiz chops one back to Groom, makes the play. Amaya moves at the third, but then Mackenzie Gore also back to the pitcher. Groom makes the play, two down with the runner on third now. And then it would be a line out to the center fielder, Applin, as Groom gets out of the jam. Bottom of the sixth, and Groom strikes out the first batter of the inning. And then with two outs, he would strike out the third batter of the inning. Two strikeouts in the inning, and we're still... A 2-0 game. Move on to the top of the ninth where Tyler Austin comes on to pinch hit against the lefty Gore, and he would make good contact, but it would be a ground out over to second base, so one down now. And then good contact and a hanging curveball for Avellino. Cannot get all of it, though. Pops at the center field. And then on the 12th pitch of the A-B to Joey Bart, he would ground at the third. Gore gets the 1-2-3 inning, and he shuts out the Sacramento River Cats here as the El Paso Chihuahuas win this game 2-0. Mackenzie Gore was flat out dominant in this game, only struck out two batters, but he went nine and got a complete game shutout, only gave up three hits, didn't walk anybody. Jay Groom had a pretty decent line. He went six strong, only gave up four hits, struck out four, only gave up two runs, but he, those two runs were the difference maker as neither team could really hit on this day, but the El Paso Chihuahuas just hit a little bit more than the River Cats. And now for a closer look at our AAA roster. First up, we've got Sheldon Noose, Ness. I'm pretty sure it's Ness, but I call them Noose in the trade deadline video. It could be either. I will look him up eventually and figure out what it is. But he's had a very good year in AAA. We acquired him at the trade deadline when we sent Mark Melanson to the Oakland Athletics. And he's a pretty interesting prospect. He's a bit older. He's currently 25. He'll be 26 next season. He's got great play discipline. He's got a great arm. And if his bat improves a bit, he could be a legit third baseman for us whenever we're done just re-upping Ryan Schimpf on one of your deals. Connor Joe, I have no idea what he is for us now, or I have an idea. He's pretty much a 4A player at this point. He always rakes in AAA, never does shit in the big leagues. He's a 4A player. So the best course of action with him might be to trade him in the offseason for another 4A player who we hope just a change of scenery or a better opportunity in a different position allows them to succeed. So hopefully we can do something like that because I don't think really Connor Joe has a future with us here in San Francisco. Seth Beer had a great year in AAA, 809 OPS, 20 home runs. He will be up in September and he will be getting quite a bit of at-bats in September. And I very, very much want him to be on the 2021 opening day. R whether that's a starting left fielder, starting first baseman, whatever it is, I want him to be on the opening day roster for 2021. Gilberto Fuentes, another guy I would like to try to get on the opening day roster for next season. 807 OPS and AAA. Still not really sure where he would play consistently, but I do want to try to get him on that opening day roster. Peter Mooney was a guy we swapped Chris Shaw for. He was Chris Shaw sent to the Rockies. Peter Mooney came to us. Peter Mooney having a great year in AAA. 819 OPS, 16 home runs, and he is a very interesting prospect. I'm doing air quotes right now because he's 30. He will be 30 next year. He's 29 currently, and he is five foot six despite hitting those 16 home runs. So he's got some pretty good pop in his bat for a little guy. He can play second base, shortstop, third base, all around the infield. He's probably just infield depth for us at a couple seasons here in AAA. If we ever need to get somebody to get called up, he's probably a guy that gets looked at. But who knows what can happen? He could have a great year and really jump up with his bat, but who knows what happens. But as of right now, he's more of a look that is just a AAA depth guy. Avellino, a 7-7 OPS in AAA. He was the leadoff guy all year long. His ratings have gone up across the board. He could be the backup infielder for us at the Major League level next season. We'll have to see how things turn out. But there is one guy who is possibly going to give him a run for his money, and that is Luis Sardinas, who is not going to be up in September, but he is a guy who had a pretty decent year in AAA. His ratings went up quite a bit, especially his contact bat. And he's already a great defensive infielder. He's a switch hitter. He's only 26. He'll be 27 next year. We signed him to a one-year deal just to be the AAA shortstop for this season. Then I was just going to let him go because I didn't think he would be anything. But looking at his ratings, he's actually somebody who could possibly get a look. So I'm definitely going to be giving it some thought, bringing him back for like one more year and either stashing him in AAA again 
or maybe giving them a shot in spring training in the major leagues, or to earn a spot at the major leagues, I should say. Now on to Joey Bart, who has been quite concerning. He only has a 664 OPS, and it's definitely worrying that he hasn't consistently hit in the major in the minor leagues at any level. He's not the greatest defensive catcher. He's by no means awful defensively as a catcher, but his bat is a big part of his game. So if he can't hit, that kind of eliminates a big part of what he is. I still think he's at least the backup catcher next season if we don't decide to move Posey full-time to first base, have Bart as the starter, and then have somebody else as the backup, and we decide to have, like, Posey getting a decent amount of time at both catcher and first base while Bart also gets a decent amount of time at catcher. I still think he'll end up in the big leagues next season no matter what, but it would be preferable that he actually hits. While Steven Duggar also has been pretty disappointing, he could not hit in the, mine in the major leagues, he lost his uh, center field job to uh, Jacoby Jones, who is basically just a better version of him. Can't hit insanely good defensively. He's just a bit better defensively than Duggar is. And he can't hit in the big leagues. He also can't hit in AAA. So he might end up in AAA to start the next season as well. We'll see what happens. But he is a guy who I would like to see possibly have a good year and really start to turn a corner at the plate. I never expect him to be Mike Trout, obviously, at the plate, but I mean, it'd be it'd be nice to have somebody at least decent at the plate rather than just a purely defensive player. Sean Jelly has been the best pitcher in AAA for us. He has a 297 ERA with a 304 FIP. On paper, he is the best of those young pitchers that are gunning for those two rotation spots they're going to be open up next season. So on paper, he's probably locked in for that spot, but we'll have to see what happens leading up into next season. Carson Fulmer also had a good year in AAA. I think I see him more as a reliever long-term who can go multiple innings if needed. He might see him in the big league bullpen next season on the opening of the roster. If not, he'll probably be in the bullpen in AAA. Jay Groom was called up to AAA a bit ago. He hasn't been the greatest in AAA, but he's still going to get a shot in spring training to win a starting rotation spot. Corey Abbott had a pretty good year in AAA. He's got decent ratings across the board. He's not going to overpower anybody, but he's a guy who could be a serviceable fifth starter at some point. He's uh, the second prospect who came over in the Brandon Beachy to the Cubs trade. Tyler Rogers is our submarine pitcher in AAA. Next season, he will be officially changed to a relief pitcher. He probably starts the year in AAA, but I mean, if he has a good year in AAA, he could be up in the big leagues at some point, because I think it'd be pretty dope to have a submarine pitcher in our bullpen. Josh James, it's good to see that he absolutely shoved in AAA after struggling in the big leagues. He will 100% be up in the big leagues in September. And Ray Black is a guy who actually had a good year in AAA. His ratings went up quite a bit, and he'll be 30 next season, but he's just a guy I don't want to give up on because he throws absolute gas. It's fun to have guys who can throw triple digits. His hit per nine and K per nine went up quite significantly. It just, I need his walks and his control to get a little bit better before I'm really comfortable doing anything with him, but he's a guy who... I don't quite want to give up on. He's currently not on the 40-man roster, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's back in our system next year in AAA as a 30-year-old AAA player. And then last but not least, you have Sterling Sharp, who has been called up from AA to AAA. He's been okay in AAA, hasn't been the greatest, hasn't been the worst. He'll start in AAA next year as well, and hopefully he can have put together a pretty good year and develop quite a bit. But with that being said, that is going to wrap things up here for this edition of the San Francisco Giants franchise, the minor league update, the second of the season, end of September, end of August, heading into September, right before a lot of these guys are getting called up for September call-ups. I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I am saying, I am the number one fan of both Nico Heischer and Swiss Hockey.